Hello, today I want to talk about poetry, particularly the poems that have haunted me across the years. So I'm going to recommend some good poems and I hope you read them. I want to kick off with a poem by Emily Dickinson, and this one really does haunt me, and it makes me believe in something more supernatural, something that perhaps we cannot see. Now, you might know if you've listened to a lot of my stuff, if you've listened to the Hardcore Literature podcast, that one of my critical heroes is the late great Harold Bloom. I see what I'm doing with explicating great literature, helping people understand the great books. I see what I'm doing as being very much in the same vein as Harold Bloom and his tradition, his, his tradition of interpretation. I'm carrying on what he uh, also carried on from those who came before him. And so this is really, really spooky because Harold Bloom died on the 14th of October. 2019. And I read, 14th of October, it was gone midnight, I read a poem by Emily Dickinson, and I believe, though I've not seen this anywhere, I believe this might have been one of Bloom's favourites. We do know that he loved Emily Dickinson, along with Walt Whitman. He held Dickinson up as part of the American Sublime, one of the great modern American poets. Uh, Dickinson is one of the most difficult poets to understand. And I was going through a tough time when I stumbled across this poem. I opened the complete works of Emily Dickinson at a random page, and I came across this little poem, which is short enough to quote here. So I'm gonna quote it now. Had this one day not been, or could it cease to be? How smitten, how superfluous were every other day. Lest love should value less what loss would value more, had it the stricken privilege it cherishes before. Now you have to read that 10, 20, 30 times before you even somewhat understand it. But I think that I read this, perhaps at the moment where one of my critical heroes, his soul departed from the earth, and at that moment he passed on the literary, the critical torch to me. Um, and I know that sounds kooky, I know that sounds crazy, a lot of people will say that's, that's not possible. Maybe not, but I think it's too coincidental. Anyway, Let's go on to another poem. Now, the next poem I would like to recommend you is Tithonus by Tennyson. He wrote this in 1833, and for a very long time I preferred Ulysses, it little profits that an idle king by this still hearth among these barren crags, matched with an aged wife, I meet and dole unequal laws unto a savage race. But Tithonus, I've come to really love and be haunted by Tithonus. You might even know the beginning of Tithonus, the woods decay, the woods decay and fall. The vapours weep their burthen to the ground. Man comes and tills the field and lies beneath. And after many a summer dies the swan. Me, only cruel immortality, consumes. And listen to this line. I wither slowly in thine arms. If you know anything about mythology, you'll know that Tithonus was granted immortality, but not eternal youth. <sighs> Painful. And um, I think Tennyson actually wrote this as a sort of Virgilian poem um, to his late friend, Hallam. Most of Tennyson's poems are filled, imbued with grief. Grief for Hallam, who died before his time. Hallam, who really uh, promoted Tennyson, built him up, um, encouraged him, filled him with confidence about his poetic technique. Tennyson was consumed by grief his entire life and it produced some really affecting poems. And I would ask you to read Tithonus. It's not that long and it should send shivers up your spine. Here at the quiet limit of the world, a white-haired shadow roaming like a dream, the ever silent spaces of the east, far-folded mists and gleaming halls of morn. The next poem I want to recommend is by Yeats. It's called The Lake Isle of Innisfree. It's a popular one. Yeats in his lifetime knew that this was the poem people most wanted to hear him recite. Indeed, you can find the poet himself reciting The Lake Isle of Innisfree. And it doesn't sound like what you might expect because Yeats had his own theories and philosophies about how poetry should be read aloud and what it should sound like. But the reason The Lake Isle of Innisfree affects me so much is because it's um, indelibly wrapped up with a very specific mournful time in my life when my aunt and godmother sadly passed away. I gave the eulogy at her funeral and I remember 
uh, giving a Bible uh, quote a Bible verse reading from a passage that talked about morning's veil and at the same time I was reading Yeats and he talks about dropping from the veils of the morning to where the cricket sings and they sort of sort of became entwined together. It's a poem that is strongly uh, wrapped up with the colour purple and a really specific mood. When I read it now I think about my longing to get away from the city and to go somewhere quiet, quiet save for the lapping of a lake and some crickets singing. Again, it's a short poem and it's really nice, so I'm just gonna read it to you. It's The Lake Isle of Innisfree by Yeats. I will arise and go now, and go to Innisfree, and a small cabin build there, of clay and wattles made. Nine bean rows will I have there, a hive for the honey bee, and live alone in the bee loud glade. And I shall have some peace there, for peace comes dropping slow, dropping from the veils of the morning to where the cricket sings. There midnight's all a glimmer, and noon a purple glow, and evening full of the linnet's wings. I will arise and go now, for always night and day I hear lake water lapping with low sounds by the shore. While I stand on the roadway, or on the pavement's grey, I hear it in the deep heart's core. Now for a long time I didn't realise what this noon purple glow was, I thought that was just a beautiful way of depicting a sunset in the poem. But uh, if you listen to Yeats read it, there's one of his readings where he explicates, and he says that in us free, um, basically means like heather field or something like that. So obviously it's the fields of heather and I think that's beautiful as well. Yeats is great. If you want more recommendations for Yeats, I'd be more than happy to give them to you. He's got some really lovely poems. He's a poet working in the same tradition as William Blake, another affecting, difficult, but rewarding poet. So, so far we've had Dickinson, we've had Yeats and we've had Tennyson and I want to throw another Shelley, a romantic poet, into the mix. And I would highly recommend if you like any of these poems or you'd like to explore these poets further, check out the uh, Pocket Everyman series. They're beautiful, little, collectible, gorgeous little hardback volumes that you can fit easily in your pocket. I'll put a link in the description below. But let's get into Shelley. Um, he wrote a poem called Ode to the West Wind, quite a famous one, and he wrote that in the autumn of 1819 uh, near the Arno River, which is near Florence. And there was a real tumultuous storm, rain and hail, and the winds were kicking up, and he wrote this wonderful poem, Ode to the West Wind. I'm, I'm going to read you a couple of selections, but I implore you to read the whole thing yourself. O wild west wind, thou breath of autumn's being, thou, from whose unseen presence the leaves dead are driven, like ghosts from an enchanter fleeing, yellow and black and pale and hectic red, pestilent stricken multitudes, O thou, who charioteest to their dark wintry beds, the winged seeds where they lie cold and low, each like a corpse within its grave, until thine azure sister of the spring shall blow her clarion o'er the dreaming earth, and fill, driving sweet buds like flocks to feeding air, with living hues and odours plain and hill, wild spirit which art moving everywhere, destroyer and preserver, here, oh, here. And you'll forgive me, I can't resist, I'm going to read the next stanza. Thou on whose stream Mid the steep sky's commotion, loose clouds like earth's decaying leaves are shed, shook from the tangled boughs of heaven and ocean, angels of rain and lightning there are spread on the blue surface of thine airy surge. I'm going to go on a little bit more. Thou for whose path the Atlantic's level powers cleave themselves into chasms, while far below the sea blooms and the oozy woods which wear the sapless foliage of the ocean know thy voice, and suddenly grow grey with fear and tremble and despoil themselves. Oh, here. And then Shelley goes on and he says, if I were a dead leaf, and he starts to hypothesise about that, he asks this west wind to make him a liar through which he can communicate with this godly, powerful, sublime 
um, presence and motivation and force. And this is a sublime poem. And what is sublime? Well, if we're going off the back of Edmund Burke's um, definition and opinion, sublime is different from beautiful. Beautiful is somewhat dainty, pretty, delicate, small. Sublime is that which inspires awe through its power. A tiger, and Blake wrote about a tiger. A tiger is sublime because it can kill you, inspires fear, it's powerful. Um, what else? If we're talking about the romantic still Coleridge, the rhyme of the ancient mariner, yeah, these storm blasts, a storm is sublime. If we're going back to Shelley and going to Mont Blanc, that is sublime, this huge mountain that inspires awe and grandeur. And my favourite line from Ode to the West Wind is, drive my dead thoughts over the universe like withered leaves to quicken a new birth. And he ends on a very, very famous line that everybody knows, even if you don't read poetry. He says, oh wind, if winter comes, can spring be far behind? Um, and if you enjoy Ode to a West Wind, I would highly recommend that you pick up Shelley's incomplete death poem, his Dante-esque poem written in Terza Rima called The Triumph of Life. And if that's not enough, check out Prometheus Unbound. Now the next poet is one who Shelley actually inspired. Shelley inspired a lot of poets. This poet, by the way, is Robert Browning. The thing about Shelley is academics today, and actually since he was around, have scorned him as though he hasn't got any value. They'll try to damn his aesthetic sensibilities and call it, uh, even though they have an actual issue with his moral sensibilities. Uh, we can talk about Shelley's uh, life and, and all that at some point if you're interested. It is interesting. But don't get caught up in all that. Shelley is a sensitive soul and he has rendered some of those beautiful, affecting and inspirational poetry in all of history. And one poet who he went on to affect, Robert Browning, is a very difficult poet. And English students today don't read Robert Browning um, unless you've got a good teacher or a good tutor who pushes you towards Browning a little bit. And what you'll find with Browning is you'll either hate him or you'll love him, okay? So if you like grotesque, like the the, um, the poetry and the pro even the prose, uh, if you like writing of the grotesque Victorian uh, grotesque, you'll like Robert Browning. If you like dramatic monologues, you'll like Browning. He is not as psychologically compelling as Shakespeare. His dramatic monologues are infused with his own thoughts, but he's a master, and if you like him, you'll, you, you won't just like him, you'll love him, and he's very, very difficult, so persevere. And one of the most difficult poems I've ever come across is Robert Browning's Child Roland to the Dark Tower Came. Uh, the story goes that Browning had a nightmare and then wrote this poem, which was a recall of the nightmare um, in one day, something like that. Coleridge did a similar thing with Kubla Khan where he woke up from an opium dream and then noted down his, his dream. But it's, it is a nightmare and it's the sort of nightmare where there is no progression and you can't trust anything that you're being told. Uh, it's also deeply metaphorical. It's this sort of night's journey uh, through, and I think it's symbolic. If you read it in a Freudian sense, um, it is symbolic of Robert Browning's own journey, his own poetic journey, and his journey to go beyond his precursors, his poetic precursors, like Shelley. But it's a really difficult poem. It's really ugly. I wouldn't say it's a, it's a beautiful poem. Um, here's a passage from the uh, 30th stanza. Burningly, it came on me all at once. This was the place. Those two hills on the right crouched like two bulls locked, horn in horn in fight, while to the left a tall scalped mountain dunce, dotard, a dozing at the very nonce after a life spent training for the sight. What in the midst lay but the tower itself, the round squat turret, blind as the fool's heart, built of brown stone without counterpart in the whole world? The tempest's mocking elf points to the shipman thus the unseen shelf he strikes on, only when the timbers start. This is the final stanza of that poem. Very resonant stanza, especially if you've gone through the whole thing and you feel, you feel the temporal uh, stickiness, I suppose you could call it, the, the sense of time almost not passing, the sense of landscape almost not passing. And this is the last stanza of that really difficult poem. There they stood, ranged along the hillsides, met to view the last of me, a living frame for one more picture. In a sheet of flame I saw them, and I knew them all, and yet, dauntless the slughorn to my lips I set, and blew, child Roland to the dark tower came.
Now let's talk Keats. If you get on with Keats, if you like Keats, then you're getting on with my aesthetic sensibilities. If you don't like Keats, I don't understand. I don't understand how, any, how anyone can not like Keats. Keats is extraordinarily affecting. His designs, his artifices are phenomenally beautiful. I actually cannot believe how young Keats was. He died well before his time. He died in his late 20s um, and he, he's so masterful. And I'll read a poem that makes me literally cry. And then I'll find out that Keats was like 24 or something when he wrote the poem. But age doesn't really define anything, does it? It's suffering and it's experience and it's life lived. And Keats, we know, had a lot of trauma with his brother dying, different people dying, getting tuberculosis, scorned in love. Keats lived a full life in his short time and it does make me sad sometimes to think that the world doesn't have all the poems that they might have. Um, he was on the cusp of writing some contenders for uh, Milton's Paradise Lost. Uh, had he just lived another 10, 20 years, but I think this was Shakespeare as well. I think this was every great poet who didn't get beyond his 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s even. Um, but that's okay, we have plenty to choose from. I would implore you to read as much Keats as you can get your hands on. It was really difficult to pick one poem. Do I pick To Autumn? Season of mists and mellow fruitfulness, close bosom friend of the maturing sun. Do I choose Ode to a Nightingale? My heart aches and a drowsy numbness pains my sense as though of hemlock I had drunk. Or do I choose Ode on a Grecian urn? Thou still unravished bride of quietness, thou foster child of silence and slow time, sylvan historian. No, if I have to choose one that I, and oh no, this is too hard. Let's just say for now, which will probably change by the end of the day, I choose John Keats's La Belle Dame sans merci. Oh, what can ail thee, knight at arms, alone and palely loitering? The sedge is withered from the lake, and no birds sing. Now imagine that you fall in love with a fairy, you fall in love with a magical being from beyond the nether world, from the dream world. You fall in love with her, you eat the fruit of the fairy lands, and then you are damned to return to mortality. Think about how much pain you would be in. And that's La Belle Dame Sans Mercy. And next I should probably mention John Donne's A Nocturnal Upon St. Lucy's Day being the shortest day. I mention this because this is the poem that enraptured me, that sort of broke me into poetry. In fact, there's a specific line, and everybody who loves poetry, uh, without fail, has one specific line or phrase or a part of a poem that they thought, wow, I didn't realize language could do that. And for me, it comes in a nocturnal upon St. Lucy's Day. And it is the, it's the part where Dunn says, study me then, you who shall lovers be at the next world. That is at the next spring, for I am every dead thing. It was that for I am every dead thing. And I know that might not sound like much, it's not hugely resonant, um, but I thought it was at the time. I must have been 12, 13, around that time, maybe 14, for I am every dead thing. And I thought, wow, typical hormonal teacher. I thought, wow, you can say that in poetry. And not only can you say that, but I felt the sincerity of Don. Um, if you want to get further into Don, I would recommend after reading a handful of his poems, like The Ecstasy and The Flea. He was a metaphysical poet, by the way, and he does some very interesting conceptual things. You might want to move on to his sermons. I studied his sermons uh, along with Lancelot Andrews' sermons at university, my second year at Oxford. And he does some very, very cool things with biblical exegesis, um, deep diving into scripture. And I would particularly recommend his sermon on the passage, Jesus wept. The shortest part, the shortest uh, scripture in the Bible, two words, Jesus wept, and he spins it out into the most phenomenal lecture or sermon. Um, really, really cool stuff. So John Donne. Let's move on to the last poet that I want to recommend or the last poem that haunts me. Has to be Shakespeare, doesn't it? Now, it's actually impossible to choose one part of Shakespeare that I want to share with you. Do you pick something from one of his plays? something that a character said, a soliloquy, or do you pick one of his many poems? His sonnets alone are endlessly ripe and your favorites will change over time. I issued a call, a homework reading assignment for you all uh, listening to the podcast and hopefully those signing on to the book club forthcoming, uh, details coming soon on that one, uh, to read all of Shakespeare's sonnets in sequence and then collect and rank your favorites. Uh, you'll know that this is one of my favorites. It's Sonnet 121. 
Tis better to be vile than vile esteemed, when not to be receives reproach of being, and the just pleasure lost, which is so deemed not by our feeling, but by others seeing. For why should others, false, adulterate eyes, give salutation to my sportive blood? Or are my frailties, why are frailer spies, which in their wills count bad what I think good? No, I am that I am, and they that level at my abuses reckon up their own. I may be straight, though they themselves be bevel, by their rank thoughts my deeds must not be shown. Unless this general evil they maintain, all men are bad, and in their badness reign. If you want to go and deep dive with me on the sonnets, it will be part of the book club when we kick it off. We're reading Anna Karenina together over the long term, and we're also doing the first uh, 17 sonnets, the procreation sequence from February onwards. So details uh, in the link below. If you sign up to the Anna book club, then you can get straight in when it drops. Um, but let me know what poems haunt you, what poems or lines from poems pulled you into appreciating poetry. What poets do you recommend? Let me know. And if you enjoyed this video, I'd really appreciate it if you hit the like button and subscribe, and I'll keep making more. Have a lovely day and happy reading.